I spent two years in that department. So uh, I really remember the hard days in that uh, Chicago campus. But, uh, he told me about how to analyze the actual uh, assessment data. And uh, he helped a lot to write a very good paper in academic, academic medicine. So uh, he uh, took some time to to have this talk. So uh, please welcome him. Uh, please. <laughs> okay, so thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate your time to talk to you about the topic uh, around some of the frontier topics that are happening. Um, and, and the focus of the presentation will be mostly on the US context. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to tell you about. And perhaps the discussions that will be stemming from the, the American context. Of course, every country that deals with medical education is very different, but uh, a lot of the frameworks in the context, again, are from the US. And um, as what uh, um, Onishi Sensei mentioned, I was here for about six months in 2017, and so it's very nice to be back here um, to continue the discussion with you. Um, since I left uh, Tokyo in 20, 2018, the February 2018, a lot of ha a lot has happened in the American medical education. And of course there was a pandemic. Uh, but since then, um, in some sense, there is some incredible things that are happening in medical education. Something that I don't think ever we, we kind of imagined what would happen. And that's really the focus of what I want to talk about because it really changes our view of how we do research and also practice in medical education. And I will be talking about this in the context of big data and, and data science. And uh, as what Tonishi has mentioned, so I'm based at, in the Department of Medical Education at the uh, University of Illinois. So some of the work um, we were able to do because we're based in Chicago as well, which is what I will also um, talk to you about. So um, I'll begin by saying a few words about the landscape of medical education, where it's changed in the last five, six years, uh, because I think that's very important. Of course, medical education has changed every few years. You know, in the last 100 years, lots of things have changed. But I think, in my view, in the last five, six years, probably um, the most important changes have occurred, in my view. So that's what I'll talk about. And then I'll also talk about opportunities in data science. And then I'll shift gears a little bit to talk to you more specifically about examples of what I mean, um, uh, and more specifically with national data, because in the American context, we were able to collect national data for the last 10 years. Uh, this has never happened. And no other country, I don't think, is able to collect national data in education. But um, because of accreditation requirements, they were able to do so. And so I'll talk about some of the opportunities that have come out from this national data collection effort. In the past, a lot of times we were focused on how do we improve education? We want to do better practice, better instruction, better curriculum. We were not able to really make the connection between education and healthcare. Everybody asks, well, why do you do education? Well, we want to improve healthcare, but where's the evidence? Now we can actually show the evidence to make an empirical connection between better education and better health. So that's where a lot of the publications are coming out. The journals are very interested. A lot of the clinical high-impact journals are very interested in some of this. So I'll be talking to you about some examples that are stemming from this work. And all of us are now focusing all of our attention on this link here, better education, better health care. Then I'll conclude with some um, um, discussion and implications. So that's a roadmap for the next hour or so to talk to you about some of these um, changes that are happening in our context. So let me uh, get started. So when I, um, it, you know, a little bit about my background. So I actually, you know, my, my training was in statistics. I, I received my graduate training in statistics. I worked in human judgment, trying to use uh, statistics to account for human judgment. And I worked in the industry 
And um, serendipitously, I moved from industry to medical education. And so this was when I moved in 2011. And when I, so I knew very little about, I knew about education, but I knew very little about, about medical education. And soon thereafter, I was confused by why the medical education system in the United States was so complicated. I mean, I'm sure every country is complicated, but I was so surprised why it was so complicated. So let me show you why um, in the U.S. setting, um, it's very complicated. And, and this will be very familiar to you if you're already familiar with the uh, medical education system. So in the U.S. context, you know, so students, when they want to become a physician, they go to college four years. And then they go to medical school, which is their undergraduate. And then they go to their residency. And then after residency, uh, they go into continuing uh, medical education. So we have these three phases of training um, generally for, for medical education in the United States. It's very similar if you're in Canada, some resemblance if you're in Europe. In Europe, maybe the college and medical school are combined. I think that's the case here in Japan. So this is six years. But in general, it's these three different segments. Um, what makes it even more complicated is that accreditation, um, the body that accredits the, the education um, is done by different organizations, as you can see here. So accreditation for medical school in the US or MD schools are done by the LCME. And then for the DO schools are done by the COCA. Licensure, which um, you get the licensing to practice medicine is done by MBME, and DOME, and then the FSMB. So you can see there's so many different alphabet letters going on just for medical school. When you go into uh, residency, accreditation is done by ACGME, and then the licensure is done by the American Code of Medical Specialties and all the other groups. And then you go into continuing medical education, you have ACCME, which is the continuing medical education, the American Medical Association, and then another different set of groups. So I began to wonder, why is this the case? Why not just have one group do everything, right? Um, you, you might just begin thinking, well, why is there so many different groups? So in the US, there's a law, there's an antitrust law. Uh, just like any type of industry, one group cannot have a monopoly. So that's the reason, I didn't realize this until a few years ago, um, because I was actually looking into the legal reasons why there's so many different groups in charge of everything. I mean, go to some, some countries, there's just one body that does everything. So it's, it's just very easy, much more efficient. But in the US setting, because of antitrust laws, um, and there's a long history in the United States, you know, with um, companies that, uh, there's a single company that's in charge of the in entire industry, the law prevents that, it's called the antitrust law. So that's why they have different organizations in charge of different bodies of education. That, that's, so nobody can, can fix this, this is by law. Um, and I guess in different countries, sometimes they follow the US system, but there's probably not a good reason to follow it. It's, it's just the way that the system is designed. It's based on um, to prevent monopoly. So that's, that's the system, all right. So within this kind of a system that we currently have, if you are an educator, if you're an educational researcher, it's very, very hard because um, everybody has a different idea of how education should be. Particularly if you are interested between the transition periods here, within here, at least there is some system, but between the two different um, phases, there's um, a discontinuity. So it's very hard to know what happens from here to here and here to here, just by the, the system. And then, um, right, so that, that's, that's why we have all of these three, uh, things. And then, um, so about 10 years ago, um, you know, when, if you're familiar with medical education, everybody was talking about competency-based medical education. You go to a medical education conference, everybody was talking competency-based and they still did. Um, so all of them wanted to do CBME 10 years ago. Um, the undergraduate did and the, the, all of them wanted to do so. And so they all had their own program of CBME going on and so forth. Um, 
Um, however, and then you go to, um, you know, uh, like Canada, you go to Europe, everybody wanted to do, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Europe or any other country or Asia, everybody wanted to do competency-based medical education. But to be able to do competency-based medical education, you actually have to collect data and to use that data to be able to inform where they are in meeting the competencies. Um, for some good reasons and so for maybe some other reasons as well, the ACGME has made it mandatory that if you want to be accredited by the ACGME, you have to gather data and you have to collect and report the data back to the ACGME two times a year for all residents in the, in the United States. And if I look back, I think the only country in the world that has made that mandatory is the United States. Of course, it, they had a lot of uh, uh, complaints, they had a lot of problems, but looking back 10 years into the system, it's the only place in the world that was able to collect data as part of CBME. It, the Canadians, there were a lot of really good reports on CBME. They didn't collect any data. The Europeans were in the Netherlands where they started the CBME movement. A lot of talk about data, nobody collected any data. So even until today, nobody collected any data except the US and the East GME. The undergraduate, they didn't collect any data, they didn't collect any data. Only this group had collected the data. And because the, the, the medicine and, and physician workforce is a, is a scientific body, if you have the data, in some sense, then you have, you have a lot of power. You have a lot of um, momentum to be able to do a lot of things once you collect data. And I think that's what the ACGME leadership realized when they started collecting the data. And then once, once they started opening up the data, when it happened. So what did they do? So, um, so with, with this national data, so when I left Japan in 2018 and went back to Chicago, um, they started collecting this data from 2013, 2014. So they were about four or five years into collecting all of this data. So once you start collecting the data, the first few years was a lot of you know, cleaning the data, to trying to see what's, what's within the data. But then five years into the data, you begin to want to do studies with the data. And, and so when, when I returned back to Chicago, the first few years were, you know, is this data quality good? You know, can we use this data? A lot of the studies were around that kind of studies. And then, then we hit the pandemic in 2020 and everybody was sitting at home. And so we were sitting with lots of data. So we started to really, you know, started to sophisticated data science um, activities. And then they started to really seriously think about what to do with this data while we were in the pandemic period. So what they had decided to do, ACGME, was to really invest a lot of resources, invest extra resources from their um, current holding and, and also um, with, with other resources that they have to be able to use this data to look at what the education data can do into practice. So when the physicians graduate from residency and go into practice, we can actually make a prediction. And then also at the same time, give this data back to the medical school. Um, so, the, so for example, if, if I'm a, a resident at the University of Illinois in medicine, um, and that data gets reported to the ACGME, the ACGME is going to return that data back to the medical school where that student came from. Um, so the school will also get information about how their students did into residency as well as a, as a feedback mechanism. Because in medical school, if you think about it, a lot of times we do a lot of things to innovate in medical school, but there's no way for us to test or empirically study whether that innovation actually made a difference into practice. Um, there are only a few things we can use. So one is we can survey the program directors and with surveys, program directors don't really respond. So the survey response rate is very low. Another thing is we can use uh, USMLE pass fail rates, but sometimes these pass fail rates are not very successful. And so this national data and its complete uh, data and really now for the first time be able to give information back to the medical schools. And that's been tremendously powerful as well. So no, no, no other time in the US history has uh, any single body been able to give data back than data forward as well. So this is something that's completely new, all because they were able to collect data in 10 years. So that's one, this is not, this is not it. 
there's something that's also happening at the same time as well. Um, the ACGME milestones uh, is, and I'll talk more about what this data means. This consists of six different core competencies, um, patient care, medical knowledge, communication skills, and professionalism, and so forth. Medical schools have their own set of, they do many, many different things. Every school can do whatever they want. And then when you're in practice, they also do you know, many, many different things. Specialties do whatever, a lot of different things. But now that they have the data, the ACGME has decided that you're, we're going to now begin using the ACGME milestones back in medical school. Um, so they formed a, a group with the AAMC, the, the ACOM, and with the ACGME called the Foundational Competencies for Medical School. So this just came out um, this year, and then they're supposed to report the formal competencies um, later this year, and then next year, we are, we are supposed to begin implementing the foundational competencies. So if you're familiar with um, like PCRS uh, or core EPAs uh, in medical school, those are um, no longer going to be used, and we are going to replace everything with this core competencies. Um, so in some sense, we have data that's being fed forward and then fed back. The curriculum that used to be separated is now the same curriculum, the same competencies for medical school, GME, and then also probably in practice. And so this has never happened again in the 100 years of US medical education. All of this happened in the last five years. So if you, if you think about it, and, and for a researcher like me, I was you know, sitting in Chicago, trying to think about all of these different things that are happening and to organize them in my, my head, this is probably going to be what's going to drive the educational research in the like, next 10 years, I, I, I believe. So that, that's why I think it's important to conceptualize it in this way, because this will help drive a lot of the questions, implementation, and also the practice. So what is happening also at the same time is that because the ACGME, they had mandated the data collection in the last 10 years, and they're beginning to publish about their data in the last five years, they have also, um, in the past, um, all of these different groups, NDME has the licensure data. This is the national um, um, residency match program. So they have the match data. Um, ABMS, American Board of Medical Specialty and Certification Data, everybody had their own data, nobody did any sharing. But now for the first time, everybody is decided to share their data because it's uh, important to see what's, what's happening. So AAMC has all of the, the physician background information, the gender, the age, where they went to school, you know, where they grew up, everything. Um, the AMA collects data on wellness and burnout. So everything is now being um, sent centrally to the ACGME so that we can really have a nice uh, data science opportunity to get education. Also, at the same time, it, even if the ACGME has data you know, for the last 10 years, there's only one data analyst at ACGME. ACGME is, uh, um, is very big, but the, their data team is also very small. So they've, um, we have partnered with them um, so this is the, the UIC, this is where I come in, uh, so that we can uh, create together this national data hub um, to, to work collaboratively with all of these organizations. So you might be wondering why us and maybe why not another school and so forth. So it happens that um, if, if you're familiar with, uh, with Chicago, um, so this is, this is um, Lake Michigan, and then this is the Chicago River here. And this is where our campus is. This is where uh, you study and where I work. Um, here to, the, this is the downtown Chicago area. It's about maybe uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes by car. And all of these organizations, they're all here. Actually, like the next building to each other and ACGME and the ACCME in the same building. So ACGME is like on the seventh floor, ACCME is on the fifth floor. And so um, a year after the pandemic, you know, I, and I live 
live here. So, so I would walk up here, meet with my friends at ACGME, talk to them about this data hub idea, and then go over to AMA, this next building, talk to them about that idea, and then the AMA. This is American College of Surgeons. So the American College of Surgeons has a lot of the outcomes data. So I would spend a lot of time here, go back and so forth. Um, and so over the years, we, we've been able to build a lot of relationships with organizations. And also, um, some of um, most of the key leadership, uh, since I've taken over as uh, department head, we've also given them faculty appointments. So the key leaders here are also faculty at, the, at UIC because of our um, educational department. And so all of that to really create the infrastructure, the ability to do data uh, sharing, to study the data, and so forth. So I talk all about this because I think um, this lays the groundwork for some of the research that I'll be presenting in the next few slides. And then this will also continue on as well. Um, so, the next few slides, I will be talking mostly about um, some of the examples of or studies that we've come. Some of them are also quite preliminary, and you'll see more of them um, uh, appearing as well. And uh, if you have questions, actually, it's we're a small group, so you can um, you can ask questions or for things that are maybe less relevant, I might skip through. Or for, but for others, um, I might spend a little bit more time as well. So um, again, you know, a lot of the focus previously was on how do we improve education? How do we build you know, more, more innovations or new curriculum or new instructional approaches, new assessments? But now it's really the ability to be able to connect education with um, healthcare outcomes. And I'll be showing you a little bit of this towards the end of the presentation because um, that's uh, where the roadmap uh, is headed as well. So, are you all familiar with the ACGME milestone system? Or I know maybe you're familiar a little bit. Of I have it. Yes. So, I think they have done. Yeah. Okay. I, I was a chief resident in the middle of the transition. So, uh, 2013 to 2014, I think, was the transition. Yes. I vividly remember how we had to revamp all the evaluation you know, forms and everything. Yeah. So, I think medicine, are, are you medicine or? Medicine. Yeah, so medicine was well, one of the first um, specialties to, to, to convert over. Some of the others uh, moved over in 2014, and even some moved into 2015. And um, so let me just spend one slide talk, uh, reviewing what the milestones data are, and then I'll go into the other things. So th this is actually um, for medicine. So in, in medicine in the US, it's a three year training. and. What the ACGME has required as part of accreditation, so it's a mandatory requirement, is that each program for each resident, they need to report every six, um, six months the progress of the resident where they are on the milestone scale um, every six months until they graduate. So for the time that they enter, it's um, July, and then the time that they graduate. So, um, so it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, three times two data points about a single resident um, throughout the duration. So if your residency program, let's say, has 10 residents per class, um, and then you have three classes, so that's 30 residents, and then you have six time points, 30 times six, 180 data points, you know, you're, you're reporting from beginning to the end uh, in some sense. So it's a lot of data that gets reported to the ACGME, and this is a requirement. And you do this for all specialties, and then also the fellows as well. Uh, so it's a massive, uh, massive undertaking that's happened. So um, some other programs like general surgery, it's five years. Um, you know, other specialties, neurosurgery, I think it's even like seven years or more. So, so the data have been ongoing in terms of data collection. And Around 2020, 2021, 2022, um, the ACGME has also begun using what's called Milestones 2.0 because 1.0 needed some improvements, so they're, they've released 2.0. So all of the Milestones data that's being collected right now are Milestones 2.0 um, because there were some problems with 1.0. They're now making 3.0, so, so it's continuously improving. 
So they're thinking a lot of it. So the next few slides, I'll be talking about this kind of data, the data that gets collected every six months about a single in, in, uh, individual resident on, on, some, um, on a mile, milestone scale. And, it's, and they're being, uh, the data for the resident is being collected across 20 plus subcompetencies. So there are many of these subcompetencies that they like. So it's a, it's a big data problem. So, um, so imagine, so if you're five years into this data collection and in, initially a lot of the residency programs, uh, you can imagine, you know, because this was forced on the programs, they were, they were doing a lot of straight lining. Everybody gets a three, you're all getting a three, you're all getting a four, and then you're, you're graduating. So uh, there were a lot of anecdotes that the milestones data, the quality of the milestones data were very poor. So garbage in, garbage out. So that was the impression that most people had. And that was the assumption that I also had about the data because nobody really knew what was happening. So one of the questions that we uh, began looking at was, what's the quality of this data? Is it, you know, we have tools to look at reliability and validity, so why don't we put them in um, and, and look at them? So between 2017 to about 2019, a lot of the studies on the milestones data focused on the quality of the data. And they did a lot of qualitative studies. AC Jamie sent people into the residency programs to listen to what they're doing, to look at their process. And there were maybe, you know, five, 600 papers that came out of just the, the quality of the, of the data. And then, so I'll talk a little bit about some of that data. And then from 2019 onward, there was more of the outcomes type data, studies that, that have, uh, have come uh, out of this as well. So let me give you some snapshots of data and some of these projects were projects that I was involved in. Um, so the, the main idea for the ACGME data, because it's me measuring data every six months, is to look at where the learner, the resident, starts and then where they end up to go for um, after residency, where they're going into practice. And here, um, some of this, um, th th there are tools that are available in the literature to calculate the reliability of the milestones data. And we actually went ahead and looked at, you know, there are two different frameworks because they do a lot of this in K-12 education, middle school and high school education. So the, the tools are already available. So we looked at, for example, family medicine. And for a surprise, uh, there are two different metrics that we can use. Um, so if we use the growth rate reliability, the reliability is actually not that bad. It's, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, uh, 0.7-ish in that range. So we were very surprised because we thought it was maybe, you know, if you do any of those uh, workplace-based um, assessment reliability, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So we were thinking maybe at best 0.3, right? But it came out to around this range. So it was very optimistic. And then the... Growth curve reliability is if you're using this number to do uh, model adjusted um, analysis, the reliability actually gets up even much higher. So it's able to um, detect growth. It's able to differentiate between people. And the data are actually quite useful in some sense. So, so when we began seeing this and we re replicated this for different specialties, we began doing some more advanced analysis with this data. All right. So one of the first studies that we've done um, collectively with the ACGME was to look at um, trajectories, growth curves, because that, again, it's just very fundamental. How do we look at growth curves? So, um, so in the ACGME, in the first five years when they started collecting the data, um, the ACGM was going around the country and they were showing the data. You know, they were saying, ah, there's PGY1, PGY2, PGY3, there's an improvement. So that's, that's their reason why the milestones data were affected. Uh, when I got the data and I plotted it out, it looked like this. And this is the real data. I mean, this, this is the actual data, but th this is what it actually looks like. But it's you know, data that's stacked on top of each other. And so a lot of the the density is actually here, but you can see a lot of it is still all over the place. And so uh, looking at this and looking at this, and then if you talk to a program director in the residency program, the residency program 
director would say, you know, I think the resident, in my mind, this is hypothetical, there's some residents who uh, increase their performance over time, others who increase but then plateau, some others who are the late bloomers, so they um, so start up at uh, slower and then increase, or there are some residents who increase but then decrease. So, you know, probably need some remediation here. So, so that, that was like, we have three different mental models of what was happening. And so the question was, can we actually look at something like this from the data that looks like this? Um, so surprisingly, um, out of this data, because again, the data were stacked on top of each other, uh, we were able to do some model um, extrapolations and we were able to find four unique growth patterns that were occurring from here. And in the milestones, the level four is the graduation target. And you can see that this people in the red never reach uh, level four. And it's actually 16% of them, 16% of the national population in family medicine. And what, what happens here is that Um, for, let's let's say if we look at this two curves here, this is a um, you know so these two curves, this black curve, and then this um, slightly pink curve. These residents are fine. You know they they start off they're you know quite at the high level, and then they reach level four by the time they graduate. But if you look at this blue and this red people here, they start off at the same place. But this red never reaches level four, and this blue does reach level four. But then at this point, there's a point of divergence. And so this is probably where you want to remediate the residents before they begin to, to diverge. And we were able to find signals like this for all of the other um, subcompetencies as well. And so we, we began looking at these different patterns of growth in the residency curves, and we looked at it for all the subspecialties as well. And you can now build curriculum out of this because if you have different types of patterns, then you can actually produce educational interventions that are appropriate for these different time points. So that's, that's one of the earlier studies that we've done. Th this uh, study we actually did in 2018, um, well, so, so a, a bit earlier into our work. Um, another thing that we began looking at earlier at this time um, was the concept of predictive probability values. And so when you have a resident with a particular milestone rating, we could tell where they are. So for example, if you are a fourth year resident in general surgery, and if you're level two out of five, then there's a 74% chance that you are not ready for graduation. So we can be able to produce this kind of metric, these predicted probabilities, depending on where you are, because we have the national data. Um, but this level of analysis is not just for research. What we found to be true was that this was actually pretty accurate. And so, um, and this was around again in 2017, 2018, and so we began to publish a lot of studies and the clinical journals too were beginning to publish them because it's big data. Um, in the past, they would have never published this type of educational studies, uh, but they were beginning to publish them. And so now that all of the clinical journals were publishing on the milestones data, um, the ACGME started to report these predictive probability values within their website. So they start to have this information ready for residency programs. So it's now a standard. So if you are at a certain level, then your likelihood for graduating on time, the probability is X. And so you probably need some remediation and, and so forth. And so um, people are now taking this very seriously as part of the interventions that are happening. So every year um, this gets updated and this gets refined, but this, um, the basis for a lot of this work and the research happened again in 2017, 2018, and 2019 to be able to do all of this. And if you think about it, this is um, 
I would have never imagined that uh, they would use this level of data in medical education, at, at least at, at this level at the national um, stage as well. Any questions so far? I know this is maybe a little bit too, um, too um, in-depth for the, the US study. But uh, the, the main point, again, is that the ACGME data has really been transformed the education landscape in GME. And the first five years, um, a lot of effort was spent on data collection, data cleaning. And then the, the ensuing, um, you know, the last three years or so of the five years, where we were uh, looking at the data for quality. And then now I'll be talking about the, the five years that follow. So now the next five years from 2020. And Yes. Is that data based on no remediation at all, or is it with the maximum remediation they can get? And now that's a, that's a great point. So I don't think anyone uh, at least documented whether they're doing remediation or not. Mm -hmm. And so it's all of the naturalistic data. So this is without any remediation. So we're hoping that this will prompt them to remediate, and then um, you know, so the probabilities will will change. Uh, we're hoping that we're, we'll, we'll be able to update this into the future using better machine learning algorithms so that it will be flexible and adaptive. Uh, so are you talking about the data taken started in like 2014? Yes. Uh, so all of the data from 20, so, um, 2013, 2014, up to, up to today, uh, it's being used as uh, historic data to calculate these probabilities. Um, and yeah, so it's, the, the probabilities are, are very refined because they actually look at all of your history. Of, let's say if you had, you know, the first year you had a rating of two and then your next rating is three. So all of these different patterns of your, of your progress and based on your patterns of progress, it will predict what your future predictions are. And those future predictions Turn out to be pretty accurate, uh, surprisingly. Um, so that's why we were finding this to be extremely useful. And again, none of this I would have imagined ever being used in medical education. I mean, you, maybe you use this in economics or in other fields, but not here. But but now this has now become one of the key tools in uh, residency. Who or which group made the decision? Right. The state. So. Um, the ACGME CEO, yeah. So he was a, a dean of a medical school um, in Philadelphia. Then, you know, he became the CEO of ACGME, and, and he's been the CEO of ACGME. I would say the last twenty years. And during the twenty years, he's made all of this very um, consistent, important decisions. So, Dr. Eric Holmby. No, so it's um, Tom Nasca. Oh, Tom Nasca. Nasca. And uh, so um, Eric Combo joined uh, ACJ in 2015. So a few years into the, actually, but without Eric, it's not where it is today, but they started without Eric and then Eric joined ACJ and then now I think it's where it is. So a lot of it is, uh, has to do with them. And I, I go to the, um, the ACGME meeting. So now the ACGME has their annual meeting. Have you been to their online? I, I've listened to yeah, everyone. So now it's about five thousand people go to the ACGME annual meeting. It's uh, it's it's, it's huge. Uh, you know the the I, I go to the double AMC meeting. It's, it's one of those annual conferences. I thought that was the largest meeting, but then I started now going to the ACGME meeting, and all of my friends who go to the AC AMC meeting are there because. We're doing all of this, so everybody needs to come in and find out the latest information. So I think, I think you know, it's, um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about the ACGM meetings as well, because they're telling about, you know, what's happening next. And so, again, all of this with the data, I mean, data, data are, are, you know, it's really powerful to have the data. Is it that I teach all the other medical systems as a non-skills? So has any like similar attempts been done before using this kind of data? So that's a that's a great question, right? So I, I was actually asking this question myself um, because the, the 
the whole idea of the ACGME milestones is you, you look at a single resident, you have a framework for competency, and you bring in a group. And to get to a single uh, milestone rating, you look at a lot of data. You look at their mini CX performance, you look at their training exam, you look at all these information. You sit down as a group, and then you decide what level they are. Um, so there is some evidence of this, like in the military, a little bit in the sports, but nothing like this. Um, so in actually next month in November, the ACGME is convening a large um, advisory panel from all people from industry, education, outside to begin looking at this framework because now people are reading about this in other fields are they're reading about this in the journals. And so people are interested, but what is this interesting framework? Uh, maybe they can use it in other settings as well. So I, I'm not sure if this exact framework is used in other settings. The closest I think is in the military when you have a group of, um, like in the military when they decide to go for, for promotion, um, that's the closest, but military is different from uh, medicines. Um, sorry, one more question. Yes. This might be a little off topic, but if you see a resident that's not growing, like yes. kind of plateauing down, yes. would you think that's the problem with the program is the problem or is it like an individual mm -hmm. issue? Because a lot of like in training exams, yes. we use that data to see how the program's doing and providing the education to residents. But milestones is really personal and individual. So I wonder if we're using this data to see which programs are really good and helping the residents grow and flourish and things, or which pro programs are kind of you know, unhealthy and not really showing a good growth. Yeah, so this question is actually like so, so excellent because the next slide I will talk about this. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're reading my mind. So at this point too, all of us, we were thinking, what is driving the score? Is it the program? Because some programs, you know, they're very stringent, so they want like everybody to be at this level. Or some programs, they let the residents do what they want, and so maybe the individuals with self-regulated learning, I want to be better, and so they get better. So what is causing that change over time? Is it the program effect, is it the individual effect, or is there some other effect that's going on? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but the, the end conclusion is that the program has a lot to do with it. The program has consistently a lot to do with it because it's the place where the students, uh, where the learners are being trained. There's also the individual aspect. Actually, Alan uh, was the first one, Alan Schwartz, to publish on this topic uh, uh, in 2018. And then that paper set the stage for the next, until now. It's, uh, uh, it's a Ryan paper. And, and you know the, you you presented your Ryan paper in 2018, right? Yeah, that was the year. A lot happened in that year. <laughs> that was a very important year. And then 2019 and then 2020 was the pandemic. So that those few years were so important for medical aid. Um, okay, so let me, um, you know, the so the last maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, let me talk a little bit about some of the predictive studies because this is where it's going into the future. I, I, I think the main direction into the future is looking at patient and clinical outcomes. This is where everybody's interested in looking at. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of the medical school to GME, some of this work. I, actually, I have a lot of interest in this work because um, there's, there's lack of connection here. So I'll tell you a little bit of the work that's happening here. And then also uh, work that's happening from here to board certification. But this link is pretty clear, but it's this link from here to here. That's I think the next frontier. That's where a lot of people are very, very interested. In the US context, in GME, um, a lot of public taxpayer dollars goes into residency, uh, Medi um, the Medicare and everything. And so at some point, I think the government will be, be asking the link to this question because we spent so much taxpayer dollars on GME. How is this improving this? And so I think at that point we'll be able to make that um, assertion. But there's also a, an interesting story that's that I'll tell you about this as well. Um, so let me begin with this, but then I'll, let me just quickly move on to this last part as well. So 
Um, so th there's a paper that we, we published and, and you know, it's really looking at the, the transition from medical school to residency. And um, I'll just quickly go through this here. So uh, to get to your question, Uh, what's accounting for the variance? What's accounting for who, who is contributing to the variability in the milestones ratings? Uh, so some years ago, um, so, so this uh, Bridget Smith was, uh, she also graduated from the UIC program, the master's. Actually, most of the research are done by the master's students from UIC. Um, she found that you know, we need to begin looking at the program level variation because the program level, where they went to their training has a lot to do with this effect. And then um, we also published a study from surgery that, um, you know, we, because we, we did a study right at the beginning of residency, like the, the first week when you're a resident, we gave this national exam to the to in general surgery. And we found that 40% of your performance during that first week was where you went to school. So the school had a lot to do with performance. And at that point, there was only 15%. But then well into your, your residency, um, it becomes about 38% or more. So, so the residency effect changes. So, so that, that's a little bit of a, a history of the different um, types of um, variance that occurs at different stages. And you can also begin noticing that these journals would have never published educational studies in the past, but now they're actively looking for education journals. And um, JAMA Open now has a spe special section on medical education. I don't know if you, you should start submitting there because they're, um, they now have a special section on medical education. It's pretty new. And their impact factor is like 13 or 14. It's much higher than like academic medicine is eight or nine, so it's, it's much, I think it's the number one for medical education. It's, it's completely uh, changed uh, since the pandemic. So let me just uh, maybe go over here. So uh, we, we looked at the, the medical school, the learner, and the program effect for family medicine and emergency medicine. Um, it, again, if you plot out the data, it looks very messy like this, but what's contributing to the variability at PGY1, also the developmental level. And one of the things that we had to figure out uh, was this, this, um, this problem called uh, cross-classification, because this is a mathematical problem. So if you have a um, a student from one class, and then they go into residency, and everybody goes into the same residency program, it's very easy to do that kind of analysis. But you have clustering that's happening here. You have clustering that's happening here. Let's say this is medical school one, medical school two. The learners will go to all different types of programs, and, and all of them will go to all these different types of programs. So when we're beginning to do the analysis, it becomes a very complicated statistical problem. Um, it's, it's not even just because there's clustering here, um, but then you have also have to cross-classify the clustering effect. Um, we found that if you ignore this, there's no signal. Um, but then once you incorporate this, the, the signals began to begin to emerge. Um, so we had to, in some sense, develop new methodologies. So we thought we were developing new methodologies. <laughs> But then I started to talk to my friends in health outcomes research and uh, health economics. They said, oh yeah, we've been doing this for the last 30 years. I mean, you, you're just now beginning to use this. This is very standard technique. So, uh, so we borrowed a lot of the methodology from the um, health econometrics people and also from uh, outcomes research. I'll show you later, the, for the patient outcomes research, we have to do the exact same thing because otherwise there's no signal. But, this becomes also not only an educational problem, but also a methodology problem. We, we never had to deal with this kind of a mess in the, in the past. So I, I wrote another paper just about this uh, methodology. So um, just very briefly, basically, um, so you, you asked the question, like what, what's, what's contributing? So a lot of the 
The competencies that's around patient care and medical knowledge and system-based practice, it depends on what residency program you go to. Residency program, because it's patient care. So if you are in a residency program at a certain place, you know, that, that's really dri driving what you do. Um, for prof it turns out, and, and it's very interesting how the data really parses this out. For the specific individual, things like professionalism, communication skills, and practice-based learning and improvement is really on you, on the, on the learner. And, and uh, I, I would have thought so, but just really also interesting to see the data parse out like this, um, in, in this way. And then for the medical school, um, a lot of impact was for the first year residency, and then also if they um, were ready for a residency practice. So, so a lot of this were very intuitive, but also um, useful to see this in practice. This, uh, um, I'll, I'll just maybe go look at this very quickly. So the, this one is um, in, in the US, in the residency, um, the residents spend a lot of time um, pre preparing for the board exams using an exam called the in-training exams. Um, the in-training exams are these practice exams that the residents take so that it will help them uh, prepare for the board exam. So we've always known that the in-training exam, so in-training exam we use to prepare for the board exam. So everybody thinks that the in-training exam is very predictive of the board exam. But if you look at the actual, um, predictive odds ratio of the in-training exam for the board, the odds ratio is very low. It's very modest, it's 1.02. So one means there's no effect, right? 1.02 is just very, very low effect. And yet we spent so much time on the in-training exam. So this was a prior study that was done. And so um, uh, Libby, she's a new MHP student at UIC. Uh, so, so she wanted to do, um, this comparison using the milestones data. And the milestones data predict the board scores because everybody thought, you know, maybe the milestones are garbage in, garbage out. Right? You might think that. But the entry exams, this is a very objective multiple choice test developed by the boards as well. So when she did the analysis, We found that the odds ratios were 2.28 and almost three here. So it's 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 completely, I mean, the magnitude is, is so different. And we were very, very surprised. So in other words, the milestones ratings that were this group consensus reports of where the residents were is actually much more sensitive than a highly objective uh, multiple choice test. Anyway, so this is another set of studies that are coming out on the utility of the milestones with the, the outcome here. The, the last thing that I will show you before I conclude is, is this last part. So how do we get from here to here? And I'll just show you one example of, of a study that we're uh, uh, So this is an example from vascular surgery. In the US, the vascular surgeons have a registry of patient outcomes that gets collected, cleaned, and gets maintained. It's called the VQI. It's a very large national database. And that's what a, a lot of the health uh, outcomes researchers use uh, for this. So um, one of our former um, OIC students, uh, she had this brilliant idea to let's look at patient outcomes using the VQI and use the milestones because the, the milestones were the data when they were in residency. This is when they're in practice. So can we make a projection from where, when they were in residency to practice? So if you make that link, then that's the, that's the golden piece that we've always wanted to know. So we um, did this analysis. Uh, so we looked at data from 2015 to 2019. And we have to stop here because now they will go into practice and we need several years into practice. And so this is a total of uh, 317 surgeons doing uh, vascular surgery um, um, EVAR and the vascular repair of, of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm for 4,200. So that's the data that we merged to. And we found to our surprise, there's no, no relationship. 
So we were, we were very um, disappointed, uh, frustrated, and wondering what was going on because we we think you know normally like the, the because we we saw all the other evidence that the milestones was predictive of board scores it's very uh, high reliability the quality is there and then when we did this there was no association so so this was uh, in 2021 2022 around this time this is in vascular surgery in 2022 there was a paper that came out from general surgery. Uh, this is Association of Surgical Resident Competency Ratings with Patient Outcomes. This is a study done by the Michigan group showing that there's no association. So that all of this would became a big shock to the ACJB community. Their conclusion was milestones ratings were not associated with patient outcomes. And they actually published this in academic medicine. It's a negative study. And so, so everybody said, see, we, we, we told you there was, it's garbage in, garbage out. There's, there's no relationship. <laughs> everybody said this. And uh, I'm not an author here, but um, see, Eric Humble is an author here. Stan Hauser is an author there. So it's, it's you know, they, they still participated in this study. Uh, I, I was participating in the other one, the vascular surgery, because uh, that's a, a UIC. So this was what was happening in 2021, 2022, as we were kind of getting out of the pandemic. This was very, very exciting, but we were seeing this kind of studies. So at the conferences, we would you know, have coffee and we'll talk about this study, this Kendrick study. What is going on? Why is there no uh, association? And so some of these guys here, uh, we began to really think what, what was happening that was preventing any association from happening. Let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to um, the fundamentals. Why, why is there no association? So Stan Hamstra suggested the idea, okay, so maybe we should, we're not mapping them correctly. We have to maybe, because initially when we did the analysis, we just read the correlation. We, we just, um, we didn't, we didn't control for anything. We just controlled, we just correlated everything from here to everything from here. Um, but then maybe we need to do uh, an expert consensus study to map everything one by one to do Adelphi and to do all of those types of things. So of course, when, when uh, Stan Hamster suggested this, all of us said, okay, not another Delphi study because Adelphi is that you have to do a survey, you have to send it out to experts, you get the feedback, you do have round two and round three. But then we said, fine, let's, we'll do a Delphi because maybe it will lead to something because we really wanted, we really thought we were at this very cutting edge um, time point. So again, Richard is the, the UIC um, person, again, the same set of authors. And then uh, I, I led this project together with them and, and we, we published just this mapping. So there's no empirical study, just, just the expert alignment. And we just did the mapping study that happened here. So we were mapping the milestones to the EVAR. Um, so so that, that's all we did. And, and we found that not all of the competencies were, were able to map. Some of them had higher weight, others had lower weight. And so we were able to fine tune the signal a little bit. So this was more from the content standpoint. And then the second thing was um, this, what we call in the health outcomes literature, it's called the attribution problem. So again, you have in the residencies, you have these different surgeons, but they're going to different hospitals. So it's very similar to the same problem we had earlier. And so we were not accounting for this uh, methodology in the analysis. So we talked to statisticians and we, we had a lot of consultation. And so we were able to refine the statistical model as well. So we did the Delphi and then we, we did this controlling that we did here. And then, so we first mapped the milestones to the outcomes, and then we resolved the attribution uh, problem from the GME program to surgeons, to the hospital, to the patient. And then we applied this new technique, this statistical technique. And then we also had to develop a new technique as well um, on top of this. And then we found that there is a very strong signal at the end. And now this paper will come out uh, very shortly. So, so we're inventing new techniques and uh, 
um, you know, without controlling for any of these, that this didn't come out. So now that this got us thinking, what well, would have what was happening in the Michigan paper? The Michigan paper didn't do any of this. Um, they're, they're, we're very good friends and we collaborate all the time, but the Michigan paper didn't do this. So we think that maybe this technique, uh, when you're looking at education data to healthcare, there's a lot of methodology that also needs to be invented to be able to do this kind of analysis. Um, this, uh, we, we were finding at, also at this time that there were a lot of correlational studies being submitted to journals. So we, we just wrote a, an editorial saying, you know, drawing a line between two points because everybody wants to draw, right? So what to do, what not to do. So this, if, if you're interested, that's a, a useful paper. So, so I, I, would, I just want to direct you. So this is in 2023, yeah, 2023. So in 2023, the ACGME in their um, annual meeting created a new, new session. This is an all, all day event uh, called Advancing Outcomes Based Research in Medical Education. This is the first time that the ACGME has dedicated a full day just on this in their big conference. And then they're doing this again in 2024. Um, so that's what they're doing. And then since then, you know, uh, there are many studies that have come out looking at milestones data with clinical outcomes. Uh, this is by uh, Lorsini. Uh, this is um, ACGME team. And, uh, and stuff. So, so now more studies coming out. And then the other paper that I just talked to you about is also. Uh, so, so this is my last slide. So, but it kind of covers, um, I think, some unique opportunities in data and outcomes research and where we are going in the next direction. And also in terms of the curriculum that we are trying to um, connect the medical school to residency and into practice that has not happened before. So this is, in my view, very exciting um, in, in education, but also uh, a lot of um, challenges for implementing into the future as well. I'll conclude here. Uh, thank you very much. Very exciting poll. And next is the educational intervention, the patient outcome. And uh, there is maybe something of the uh, missing link between the two. But uh, I need to learn more about this new technique. Any comments or questions? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. This is very exciting. Um, so my first question is, so I think it's safe to say that accreditation is worth the cost of mm -hmm. all this. Is that what ACGME is trying to say? Because during my master's with Famer and things, my, my main topic was, there's not much data or evidence suggesting that accreditation system itself improves educational quality or health outcome qualities. Any country, no country has that data. But now maybe this will be the first time ever in history that suggests that a good accreditation system, looking into every program, it provides a good outcome. I, I think you raised an important point about the, um, the utility, the consequences of accreditation. I think an important factor within accreditation is the data collection process, and then how you evaluate the accreditation. Um, I don't think there's a one approach to, um, or the best solution for how you collect the data, but more so of, uh, continuously improving the process to collect data. So. The ACGME is, you know, using the 1.0 and then now the 2.0. So hopefully we'll get better and better over time. And the fact that, you know, we're using the data to continuously study and to improve, so I think that's another thing. And then the third area too now is um, to be able to use the data for um, um, for research and, and to have data 
publicly available. So you can actually request this data and you can do things with the data. All this uh, you know, democratizing access to the data. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that's also really changed. So we, we never thought we'd be able to get this data. But now you can, uh, like you, you can request through your presentation of why if it's a decision. I see. Yeah. You're like this is like 40 years ahead of Japan. <laughs> we don't really have this kind of data or ways to measure this. Just um, my, my other question was 25% of workforce in the United States is IMGs. And you said you feed back the data to their medical schools, but are you going back to their IMGs medical schools or IMGs just within an IMG category? Look at yeah, so I think that's an area that I, I, I don't think, I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that the, uh, the international medical schools are getting that information back. Mm -hmm. um, we do, uh, we have done some analysis with um, data with the IMGs or with data without the IMGs. Uh, it, it's quite different in terms of, uh, so the data become much more richer if you include IMGs. Um, so I think, I think that should be the direction to a lot of this also is the um, like data privacy, and so that once you have data and you try to share things, everybody becomes very nervous because it was privacy. And um, so, in my case, you know, when I have given access to my data, I had to sign so many papers. The lawyers at my university <laughs> had to sign so many things, and 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 we had to buy a new server and all of this protection. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just raises a lot of um, questions, but yeah. Interesting, because in the United States, it's really team-based model in practice, like surgery outcomes and things. I, I don't think it's just the surgeon's skill. I think it's the whole OR teamwork and post-OR care from the nurses and everything that leads to other complications. So yeah, maybe the data from the um, Michigan or maybe it's based on every hospital's quality of the teamwork about the surgical outcomes. Uh, so um, a little bit more of a broad response is, I think we still need to learn a lot about you know, how to do this kind of analysis. Um, the other thing too is the, the vascular data, we use the vascular uh, quality measure. So it's a, it's a registry. The Michigan group used um, insurance data. So sometimes when you, Claim insurance. Sometimes the data, the quality is maybe good, maybe not good. But then um, in the registry, that's the data directly from the electronic health record that the physician enters. So it's it's much better quality. So the data quality for the patient outcomes is also very much variable. So we're figuring out a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so you said that you could give the feedback to the university and also the residency program as well? Yes. So have you seen any university, the med school or the residency program uses your their individual data to do the program? Yeah, so um so we we have a little bit of um uh, so they started doing this in uh, 2021. The ACGME started giving the data back to med uh, medical schools in 2021. And so if, if this is University of Illinois. So I was talking to my friends, these different medical schools, and everybody <laughs> didn't really know what was going on. I asked my friends at University of Chicago, did you know that you're able to log in and get your data? And said, oh, I didn't even know. She, she was the dean of uh, education. And, and so we, we created this uh, consortium um, of course, everybody can do whatever they want, but we created this consortium so that all of the student data um, are also shared at the, at the very fine, uh, fine grain level. And then we can also create best practices. So this is something that the, the community is also doing. Now that we have this data, we need to figure out how to use the data and how to help us improve. So um, next month and at the AAMC meeting, we have several sessions on how to use this data, how to help improve and how to give this information to the students. Uh, we have another consortium like this for the residency programs too, so that the program directors, also the educators, know how to use the data. It is too cool that probably about ten years later, 
that they might want to use this kind of data to work for advertising their rescue mm -hmm. program to appeal for yes. questions? We're hoping, um, yeah, it may, it may not be used for those, those kind of purposes, <laughs> but probably it will. I, yeah. I don't, we don't know, but uh, yeah. Exciting. Thank you very much for Maybe the same thing is done in the East Asian countries, maybe such kind of advertisement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. oh. Is there any discussion to get rid of the in-training exam based on these data? Because it's a lot of work for the residents to do. Yeah. Um, not that I've heard of because the boards, you know, that's their big business is the in-training exam. So, um, you know, actually, that paper, the the a few of the authors were from the board, and they couldn't believe it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, so we'll we'll see. But I think, you know, the th this is very exciting for for us in the journals to just to be able to see every new issue now talks about this kind of data, milestones, these things. So, in terms of the in training data, maybe uh, it's. Only from MCQs. Yes, it's not on. So maybe that might have a like correlation with uh, like medical knowledge data. Yes. For ACGM viruses. Yes. Uh, yes. So they're they're highly correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Uh, and then, but the milestones. Is yet still a better predictor of the board scores than the training exams, which is very interesting, because um, to you look here, I mean, this um, this qualifying exam, this is a multiple choice test, so the the milestones. To here, the, the odds ratio for medical knowledge is 2.17, and this is only one. And so it, it's, I, I don't understand why, why, why is this only one and then this is 2.17? It's, there's some, some additional thing that the program directors are picking up or something else that gives a higher, double the uh, magnitude of the, of the signal. Th this one also includes communication skills because it's an oral exam. So we also put in the, the ICS is um, interpersonal communication skills. So it's the odds ratio is almost four, 3.8. Not only the medical knowledge, but also the patient care. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's, 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 it's it, the, the milestones data, in some sense, you know, it, uh, it's not it's not just garbage in, garbage out. There's some really important signal that's happening there. It's not an open book test. So, yeah, these are board board exams. Yeah, uh, and I think that that's why the the adults should publish this because, you know, when um, um, when when we first did this analysis and uh, you know we showed it to Eric Kumbo, Eric said, ah, you know, just send it to like a like a conference poster or something like that. But 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 she she thought this because of this. And so she sent it to the annals, and then they, they published it. So, so we we were all happy, but but none of us thought this would be getting that level of attention. Um, this is for um, for uh, doctor. Um, so, is there any like future development that will be used in or like that are collecting from other professionals, like in healthcare system? For instance, or like social workers or OTs or other professions? Yeah, so that's a great question for other health professionals. Uh, at the moment, because the data are only collected for physicians, uh, that's the only reason why we can do this. But the, the pharmacists are also. Um, they, they, they're also big into CDME, the competency-based uh, education. So they're, everybody is seeing what's happening here. And so they're now trying to see the power of data. So I think they're going to be, begin collecting the data. The dentists are also interested in collecting this data. Um, nursing, I'm, I, I'm not too familiar with what's happening with nursing. Uh, physical therapy, I know, is also interested. 
So it's um, yeah, there we'll, we'll see what's happening in the other. Will have like teachers that from the university that like how to improve and how they the actual improvement then maybe this can be like a good example for other professions curriculum development or maybe improvement too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's the probably the next direction. Yeah. You know, in in January, the the veterinary veterinary medicine. This is for animals. <laughs> they invited me to give this presentation because the. The veterinary medicine are also interested in this as well. So I think across the various uh, health uh, areas, interesting. interesting. Yes. So the question you mentioned that this is only in America done. So what about other countries? Are they also interested in utilizing the collection? Yeah. So I I can say maybe just um so in in Canada they are also very big on CBME. Uh, actually, a lot of the Initial discoveries of CBME happened in Canada. Uh, so I asked my Canadian friends, why have you not collected data? Um, uh, so that's the main problem. They, they have data from each of the medical schools, uh, but not centrally. Um, so there's some studies coming out of University of Toronto, Queen's University, but not at the national level. Uh, and every school is different, so unless if you collect something at the national level, you can't do anything like this. Um, again, same thing in the Netherlands, because the EPAs were developed in the Netherlands, uh, but every school is doing their own thing, so you can't do this again. In the same with UK, the, maybe Ireland, I think Ireland, because um, it's a single system in Ireland, so it, maybe they, they have Maybe Japan is the next place mm. <laughs> to do so it. Establishing a standardized database mm. might be the first issue. And in Korea, um, last year, um, there was some interest in the um, South Korean um, educational system. So, so there is some discussion, but I don't know where they are. A lot of them, they have a lot of interest, and then it just interest goes down, <laughs> just like with anything. After a few months, so, but I, I'm always impressed how Tom Naska at ACGME, he must have had so many people raising concerns for collecting this data as part of mandating uh, when when it first happened. I, I don't know, was it a happy implementation when you were a chief resident? Oh no, not at all. Yeah, right, I mean, like twenty two reporting milestones every six months. We had like sixty residents in the whole program. Yeah. Uh, we had to train all the attendings that yeah. create them. We had to go through the other anchors and everything. It was, it was a really hassle. Yeah, so I, I don't know how he was able to force everybody to do this because, and he just stood by it and he's still, still active. I think he's like 90 years old. Really? <laughs> he's very, uh, he presents and very, very, a lot of energy. This last part, please don't include it. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we learned a lot, and I hope that you this whole product. Um, and uh, please let me know if you have interest in any of these uh, work or if you're in Chicago or visiting some conferences. Uh, Sensei has my uh, hope to uh, collaborate with you. So, thank you very much. I really hope uh, Japan develops some kind of ACGME-ish organization. We have 